Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Episode 65 of the Terrible Book Club. This time, we read Final Fantasy VII, On the Way to a Smile, by Kazushiga Nojima. And today, we have a special guest on. Also, I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hi, Paris. The special guest today is my brother, Adam. Hello, everyone. There was a, there's a person that's kind of half the same genetic data as me, and he's here today to share in our wonderful journey of a, a book that has a really weird title. Wait, did you guys come out of a machine like in the fly? Like, is that how you have like? Is that how you yes. share genetic data? That's okay, exactly true. Great. Yes, absolutely. So, if you've never heard uh, the show before, if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. So we read books that we would never read under normal circumstances. Uh, usually, this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while, we end up liking the book. Uh, today, this, this is, um, it's kind of an, so this is an extended universe novel from the Final Fantasy video game series, the seventh Final Fantasy. Specifically the seventh Final Fantasy. Also, I'm a grandma, so the, this is Every like Final Fantasy has a completely different world and characters and, like, all these kinds of things. So this yeah. is specifically based on number seven. All right. Uh, for content warnings, I think today we've just got our usual barnyard language. I don't think there's anything too crazy in the text. Um, so the summary for this book is as follows. The apocalypse is over, but the journey is only beginning. The world may not have ended after the meteor fell, but life has forever changed for the survivors of the cataclysm. Mako is no longer a viable source of energy, and an incurable new disease is spreading amid the societal upheaval. But even when brought face to face with grief, regret, and despair, people will find a way to pave their own path to the future, to stand tall and live. This collection of short stories serves as an epilogue to one of the most beloved installments of the hit Final Fantasy video game series, as well as a prequel to the cinematic follow-up Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, a must-own for enthusiasts and newcomers alike. Speaking of enthusiasts and newcomers, I figured that was the interesting dynamic for this episode, because I'm sure we probably have some fans or listeners that have played this video game before, because, I mean, it's a fairly popular thing. Adam and I... This happened to be one of the first video games we ever played, period. And we, when, when we first started playing it, it was basically a bonding experience for the both of us. So we have so much love for this world, so much like of our time and childhood invested into it. And Paris, you could give a fuck. I'm pretty <laughs> no, sure. all right, all right, dude. Some of us grew up with Nintendo, and some of us had it's form- no, I'm not like some sh- of us had formative experiences with Mario. That's okay, fine. I'm not shaming that. I'm just saying that Look, we the, can argue about the dynamics. No, 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 and- no, no, no. <laughs> so many people have shamed me in my life for not being into Final Fantasy, and I'm just like, fuck you. I didn't have the system. I didn't fucking know it existed. I didn't know. I Final didn't Fantasy know. was originally on Nintendo systems. Yes, it was. Not the one I had. If you could play Super Nintendo, you could play Final Fantasy. Oh, well. <laughs> Four through six. I didn't yep. know. No, but seven wasn't on that. No, that was PlayStation. I had an N64 after the Okay, Super yeah, and that, that was absolutely no. No, no, I didn't. And the, and the Super Nintendo was like at my grandma's house. So, like, I don't think she was like, oh, man, I just got the newest Final Fantasy. <laughs> like, we had we had old Mario games. That's I all love I... the RPGs. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So that's what I figured would be the interesting dynamic here for this episode is two people that, like, grew up loving the shit out of this and someone that is just here to objectively read a book yep, about it. Yep, just a book. <laughs> so... I, you know, as a fan of Final Fantasy VII, it wasn't horrible. I it mean, was yeah. just like, there wasn't. It was just a bunch of loose vignettes. If you're looking for some yep. kind of story that over, I keep tapping your 
mic stand. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, this is an impossible predicament we're yeah. in right now with this microphone. So, <laughs> but uh, like I was saying, it, it. I lost my train of thought. Actually, so uh, <laughs> you were talking about how it's just short vignettes, and if you're looking for like an overarching story. I mean, that's not yet yeah, what we well, hear. Kind of, because all the vignettes are connected. It's kind of like we're watching fucking Steel Magnolias or some shit. <laughs> oh, like, wow, <laughs> high praise. No, 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 no. I mean, actually, I I didn't think it was that bad. Uh, some of the characters I just liked. I'm not really into anime shit. This is anime as fuck. But like, the it was you know the work was spell checked and edited. The dialogue was it sounded you know mostly fine. I actually thought the the writing that was supposed to be from a child's perspective was pretty good. Like, I thought that it was realistic the way that the the child Denzel was written. Not in the original game. He is an expanded universe figure. Ah, uh, well, here. I enjoyed him. Um, there was a bunch of shit that I thought was really fucking dumb. I suppose we can take this vignette by vignette Yeah, here. that's how I've organized my notes. Um, so each, uh, each section of the book is about a certain character. Um, so we get different point of view chapters. You know, like we're reading Game of Thrones, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, what a comparison! Yep. Right at the game, we're Rain, 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 Game of Thrones. Yeah, Steel Magnolia. This, yeah. is, this is the Game of Thrones Steel of gaming Magnolia books. Game of Thrones, like immediately. <laughs> How can no. this be terrible? It can't be. This now. is not okay. Neither of those comments were in reference to the content. They were in reference okay. to the fucking right, structure. Before we get into the any structure and character, how do you feel about just the general world you were thrust in? Like, like the character, the general feel of the world. Um, I mean, I just felt like somebody was writing. A sci-fi commentary about our modern world. Kinda that's all. It, that's all it felt that, like. That's. I. I think that's an accurate assessment of the, what the intent of the original game was. Because the original, the, the setting, Midgar, it's like a futuristic city almost, but in a way, it's supposed to be contemporary. Because as you as you've probably read in the book, the whole, entire city is run by a power company called Shinra. Yeah. And Shinra is sucking out the life energy of the planet to power other things. Which is what we do currently as yes, a society. Exactly. Except um, our energy is a little different in that it's not yeah. made up of literal souls. You know, <laughs> it's just a different planet. Some planets have souls. I mean, no, but arguably our energy is just dinosaur souls. You could say that. We're just using dinosaur souls and they're using human souls. That's I was the a only T-Rex, thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I guess maybe giving a brief background, like, okay, so Adam was explaining that the main town that we're in for a lot of this city, actually, is Midgar, um, it's run by the Shinra Elect Power, Electric Power Company, yep. right? Yep. And they're, they're kind of a, I don't know, general authoritarian power. Yes. Uh, and there, there are some other towns we were introduced to, like a town called Calm with a K, mm -hmm. um, I forget some other places like the jungle or forest or something. There's a couple of places that are like locations from the video game that are kind of dropped in. You got yeah. your Nebelium, your Rocket Town, your Costa del Sol, your Junins. Um, I can keep going. I love this game. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here to temper that love. Don't you worry. Uh, so, and uh, immediately before the book takes place is when the game and in the yes. game, I guess the. What okay? I'm gonna tell you, yeah, you what know I what? garnered yeah, let's, let's from hear the yeah. interpretation of what she thinks happened in Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> okay, what I think happened. Uh, I don't have to reference my notes. Um, so it seems like, uh, uh, I almost said Avantasia, the eco terrorist group, <laughs> <laughs> Avalanche. Oh, that, oh, deep cuts. Avalanche, an eco terrorist group. Uh, were, they were going to cause a disturbance at a, a reactor. So I was thinking of it as a nuclear reactor, but I guess this Mako energy, it's not really nuclear energy. So it, so the, the it's processed souls. Yeah. So it's, it's just like, the, it's like, I don't know, super fuel, super oil yes. kind of. Yes. So anyway, they, they're going there to cause a disturbance do some damage, but they end up actually just blowing up the whole reactor and causing a huge fucking problem. And, um, this, uh, oh shit, does the, what happened? Is the Don't meteor, work, just go off the, the meteor car, happens just right after that? Okay, well, there's a uh, lot in between. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot in between. So much in between. <laughs> okay, well. You um, basically just talked about, like, the first two hours of the game and then, like, the final four. Okay, <laughs> well. Uh, of, like, a 30, 40, 30 to 40 hour game. <laughs> All right. So much fuck this. off. I had 180 <laughs> pages to whittle this out of. No, that's, that's why it's um, funny. And so, 
Uh, it, obviously, the reactor blowing up causes a bunch of devastation. The wait, was it was it actually the eco terrorists or was it actually Shinra that caused the? Exp- I fucking the, the Shinra dropped the plate, but they blamed it on Avalanche. Okay, yeah. so the reactor was in was in the floating city yeah. above. So Midgar is a is a is a layered city, right? Yeah. It looks the, like a pizza. It's like a pe- but the pizza trays that you get yeah, at a yeah, yes, restaurant. Yes, yes, okay. Yes, yes. So so the upper level is like the fancy ass people and then the lower level is the slums yes, where yes. regular people live and the reactor blows up and that's a problem but then the city itself falls onto the poor people and One crushes them. One slice of the pizza. Oh, yeah. sector 7. Yes. yes. Sector yes. 7 pizza the fell. Sector slice seven. of pizza. Sector Props on everyone yes. in their cheesy doom. Right. So that whole section is fucking obliterated obviously. Mm-hmm. Um and the city kind of because the reactor blew up and everything everything was fucked up everything's in upheaval and then there's a meteor speeding towards them i don't know what the time <laughs> lapse is there i love this keep going so now we're on uh, hour 5 of the okay. game versus hour 36 to 40 it's <laughs> shut up uh, so there's a meteor speeding toward them and everyone's like Oh, right. There's a disease. There's the geostigma. This is not in the game at this all. Is oh, geostigma oh, is completely oh, not in sorry. the game Sorry. Okay, I take that back. Sorry, they made it seem like it was happening I, yes, I understand, simultaneously. Yeah, but just to, like, sort of yeah. guide uh, your course. All right. Geostigma um, is not a part of the first game at all. Never mentioned ever. Okay. So, uh, anyway, the, the city is all fucked up. And suddenly there's a meteor. And everyone's like, well, I guess we're going to fucking die. But then the Earth is like, no. I will destroy this meteor with my soul energy. And so the earth itself somehow has enough sentience to direct this life stream energy at the meteor to blow it up. And the world is saved? In Question a way. mark. In a, way. In a yeah. way, there are some repercussions, which is largely the geostigma <laughs> yes. that yes. infects everyone afterward. But I guess that's not in the game. Um uh, oh yeah, I didn't talk about any of the characters because fuck them. We'll get to them. We'll get to them. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're gonna looking spend for the whole. The broad overview yeah, here. we're gonna spend the whole episode talking about them. Um, I feel like much, that's kind of yeah, all I that's, needed. That's what you oh, got. and someone named Aerith died, and everyone wants to fuck her. That's what I gathered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's oh, and there's a there's some fucking undead dude who has a huge heart on for Cloud, and he just can't let it go. Like he could have accomplished so much shit, but he's just like like he could have taken over the planet at this point. I think it's Sephiroth, right? Yeah, yes, this yeah. is his aim at the. F- this, all right, this fucking dude. Could have taken over seven planets if he does if he didn't just sit there well, and no. pine over cloud. Well, no, but yes, <laughs> okay. This is what here I'm... is a. I will give you the basic rundown of the backstory for people who haven't played the game and for just a clearer picture for someone. Paris please here. animate this these explanations too. Like if you can oh, do that, that'd please, be amazing. Please. Okay, so the Midgar stuff is basically just the setup for the rest of the story. After Avalanche, they purposefully blow up reactors. It's not an accident. They are 100% blowing the shit out of these reactors. Oh, then whoever... 100% the, on purpose. Then whoever the character was that was explaining this is lying to themselves. Yes, 100%. Ah, uh, I was so, lied to. In the course of this, they are eventually captured by Shinra. Yep. And when they are in the Shinra building, apparently Sephiroth breaks out of wherever he has been hiding, murders President Shinra, Rufus takes over... And now Cloud is on a quest to find Sephiroth because he has found, oh, he's come back. Sephiroth is a figure from Cloud's past that destroyed his hometown, burned it down to the ground. Yeah, because he only wants Cloud to love him. He doesn't want there to be anyone else in Cloud's life. He actually found out that he is the result of experiments done on him by a professor from the Shinra Corporation. He was injected with Mako, Mako or Mako, depending on how Mm. you pronounce it. And Genova cells. Genova is an alien creature that crash landed onto the planet. Okay, you don't, you can't go around <laughs> injecting people with alien cells. Come on now. Cloud was also ha, also had these experiments done on. Right, because they were were they both in the soldier program? Yes. Well, no. Cloud thinks he was in oh, the yeah. soldier program. He stole his memories from his friend. He was who was traumatically killed in front of him. The Buster Sword is his friend Zax. Who is Aerith's ex boyfriend? Oh, geez. All right, hang on, hang on. Also, we should probably put a spoilers at yes, the beginning the for best of spoilers. Okay, for okay, so. If you haven't played this 25 oh. year old game, spoilers. <laughs> Say, I haven't. Yada, yada, yada. Right, Cloud no, no, is now. No, 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 no. Don't fucking yada out over that. All right, so. So, Cloud has adopted the persona of his dead friend, Zach. 
parts he, of his memories. He says, I used to be in Soldier. I was a member of the we why does, missions. Why does he have these memories? He was experimented on by Hojo. Zack was the, the person that he's basing his memories off of, was uh-huh. also experimented on. They broke out. They crawled to Midgar, basically poisoned with Mako and like reeling from all the radiation and experiments. Shinra catches up to them. Zack is murdered in front of Cloud's eyes. Okay. This traumatic event effectively gives him PTSD that sort of has him disassociate and take on the memories of his friend. Because he's found by Tifa later outside. Is that Tifa? Tifa, Tifa. Uh. Outside her bar. And he like is like basically freaking out and like disassociating until he sees her. And then he starts saying shit like, I used to be in the soldier program. Yeah, I finally made it, Tifa. Remember when I promised you I'd become a soldier and protect you? Turns out, when he went back to Nebelium years ago, when Sephiroth burned it down, Tiffa was there, and he was actually just a grunt, a soldier that had a mask on the whole time, and Tiffa didn't know he was there. But every time I think he claims that Zack did, when he was on the mission that caused Sephiroth right. to burn Nebelium down in right. their hometown. Nebelium? Ne- ne- Nibelheim, Nebelium. Yeah. There's so many different ne- ways to pronounce these things. Nebelheim is ne- definitely the way to pronounce it. Yeah, because it's based on Norse. On Niflheim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but she knows something's up because she knows Cloud wasn't, like, doing the things that he said he was. He was just observing from the sidelines, but he somehow has these memories. Yeah, that's confusing. And Tiffa just shuts up about it. And she's like, he's, okay, clearly I just shouldn't pry about whatever he's lying about. Yeah. Right here. Yada, yada, yada. Yes. Cloud and company go off to find Sephiroth. Turns out you find out that the Genova cells that everyone, that people that were experimented on were injected with have a will to reu- reunite and recombine. So everyone's compel- everyone that's been injected with Genova cells is-, is compelled to come back together. Sephiroth uses this to effectively control Cloud because he can kind of take over that Genova call from within his body. Because after the- he got... When the whole, nib- the whole thing with Cloud's hometown burning down happened, Cloud actually threw Sephiroth into the life stream because of that. And yeah. Sephiroth was able to sort of merge with the life stream and then compel all the people with Genova cells to try to find him. And the whole game is you trying to chase Sephiroth when it's really him calling you forth uh, using the Genova cells. Isn't that clever? Eventually, they get to the point where they find the Black Materia, the ultimate destruction magic, which calls forth the Meteor spell, which is big right. capital M Meteor. Why do they call it Meteor, not the Meteor? Like- so throughout Final Fantasy, Meteor was a spell you could cast very high level magic. In most other games, there was just like a spell you could cast in battle. Okay. But in this game, it turned it into like the apocalypse. Like you cast a spell that's going to destroy the fucking world. Mm. Right. Sephiroth's aim was to use the Black Materia to call the Meteor down. If he wounds the planet enough... The life stream will spill forth and try to heal itself, and it will be weakened, giving him an opportunity to control the planet and the life stream. Okay, okay. Yada, yada, yada. Cloud and his friends defeat Sephiroth. The world (laughs) is saved. And Aerith was killed by sort of a clone of Sephiroth, or basically one of the other people injected with Genova cells. Yeah, he was saying that. That could disguise themselves as Sephiroth because of reasons. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, well, this this is my other thing, like... All he does is talk about cloud, cloud, cloud. And I'm like, dude, you can literally make people, you can summon human forms to walk on this earth. And yet you are in here jerking off about this dude. Like every time I read a piece of him talking about cloud, it just sounded like some scorned lover who is still obsessed <laughs> with so this many guy. So fan are based off of this Paris. Oh, so am I right? Yeah. Oh, is this a best- ding, ding, ding? <laughs> yeah. So this is what I was afraid Did I win a washer and dryer? <laughs> this is what I was afraid of going into the book. Like, it would be something like that. Like, that's the type... I thought this was purely going to be a fan fiction type thing where oh. it's... I mean, it's an official release, so it, it is part of the expanded universe, but I'm not a big fan of fan fiction in the first place. From That's just, you know, my opinion. Oh, yeah, same. I'm not a fan. But... Luckily, this book turned out a lot better than I thought it would. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. It honestly was a lot better than I thought it was, too. Okay, so now that we're done talking about yes. not the book. Let's get into the proper short stories now that you have some backstory. Yeah, about so that, that's what you needed to know for the story. So the first, so it's divided into, what, seven sections? About seven or eight. Uh, Seven, yeah. All right, so the first one is Denzel. And Denzel is a child who was pretty seriously affected by all of these events. Uh, both of his parents were killed in the... When the plate dropped. When, the, when, when the, Shinra destroyed Sector 7. Yeah, when the uh, upper city fell on the part of the lower city, his parents were both killed. 
he gets kind of like passed around between parental like parental guardians that kind of suck but then he eventually finds this really nice old lady who takes care of him for a little bit and i thought that was that was cool um i just i liked this section because i felt like the way the child was written was actually i mentioned this earlier but was quite good um it's a child suffering from loss right and he's lost his parents he's lost his direction he like lord of the flies it up a little bit with some like slum kids finding scraps to like help people build shit all the time until he kind of well this was like after he shacked up with the grandma because the grandma dies eventually and that's why he's forced to kind of go off on his own infected by geostigma he's infected with geostigma a disease that's kind of like a leftover remnant of the it's i i don't remember the exact source of it there's some black water probably sephiroth or something right like, yeah, yeah it's it's, a, it's it's definitely part of the whole sephiroth live stream corruption right thing. Yeah, yeah it's it's basically genova cells in the live stream that have spilled forth and are infecting people the disease works in a weird way where if you're a little bit sad it'll kill the shit out of you but if you're got a strong will to live you're a-okay yeah, my note was, God damn it, depression's in water now. Like, <laughs> oh, fuck. We can't escape it. Is geostigma affecting your life? Oh, I... I <laughs> Talk to a doctor I about actually have... not being sad. Just don't ever be sad. Don't be sad. Geostigma is a liquid depression enhancer causing death when you think about giving up on life. Do not use geostigma if you have thoughts of suicide, are sad ever, take blood thinners, or have recently been consumed by the live stream. The planet is not responsible for deaths caused by geostigma. Enjoy geostigma responsibly. Be happy. <laughs> So Denzel kind of sees a lot of these people that are affected by this disease and straight up dying. Like, people are dying left and right. It's the oh, fucking yeah. plague up yep. in here. I guess everyone in Megar was super sad, well, because ha- fucking half the city got destroyed. Yeah. By not just the meteor, but the life stream, like, trying to protect the rest of the planet from the meteor. And the other important thing to note is that uh, this is a society that, you know, ran on Mako energy so much that they were dependent on it. And now they have to find alternative forms of energy. And that's referenced quite a bit in this because they're trying to rebuild society, essentially. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff happening in this Denzel. There's, I mean, that vignette is solely about Denzel dealing with the after effects of this. And seeing it through a kid's point of view is actually kind of interesting. I mean, yeah, we've seen other post-apocalyptic things through a kid's point of view, but I guess I haven't read enough YA novels to get completely sick of it yet. No, I think that people often don't do a good job writing child point of view because they they age the kids up too much or they make them so stupid that they're like not even a functional being. And I feel like this 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 part of the book did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, you know, he's such a dignified child because he orders coffee at one point. <laughs> yeah. which is like a, a... The book starts off with this kid meeting up with um uh this this random dude who, you know, we later find out has some significance, but He's meeting up with this guy at a restaurant and and uh the guy who works at the restaurant is like giving him a, giving him a hard time or not a hard time but like joking with him. He's like, "Oh, are you meeting a you meeting your lady friend?" He's like, "I'm on a coffee date." And I'm like, "Children of coffee <laughs> dates? Well, shouldn't you be having a milk date, like juice date, like No, this kid's seen some shit. He's seen yeah, some about yeah, hard stuff. Right. Then I read he the rest of the chapter. Yeah, then I read the rest of the chapter and I was like, "Oh yeah, that kid's fucking fucking whiskey in his coffee." <laughs> he needs Jesus. To perk up a little bit. Um, and then there, yeah, so the guy he's coming to interview, or he's coming to meet with, uh, is named, uh, uh, starts with an R. Reeve. Reeve, thank you. Um, and Reeve walks in, and the waiter at the restaurant who had been talking to Denzel and was kind of like, you know, joking with him, I don't know, Reeve asks politely for a cup of coffee, and the waiter is like, oh, that's one badass guy. And I was like, <laughs> what? Like, I, this guy like, explicitly has a coffee bar. Like Everyone who comes to order coffee is like a real badass. Like he, Everyone that walks through this guy's door is yeah, like, yeah. Whoa, give shit, me a he ordered, coffee. He ordered a drink? Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and the whole, the chapter is set up in in basically like Denzel is retelling the story of the, his last couple of years to Reeve. And explaining like the day that the the city dropped on the slums and how his parents died and like my next two notes are just like oh this mom is so dead oh dad also <laughs> very dead just because the way that they were written about I'm like oh they're about to be off in a second um, I was oh some of my notes at the beginning are very confused because at this point I know nothing about the world I am learning it as I yeah, go yes. right. and yeah. I was like wait a nuclear reactor blew up but that wasn't what harmed people like what and i was so confused because i thought the reactor was nuclear it didn't occur to me that there could be another type of energy 
yeah, paired it, in with a reactor. Even though people get Mako Mako poisoning, it's not like radiation no. necessarily. No, like it's if you not. blow the reactor up, people that are caught in the explosion are killed, and that one hundred percent happens. Like Cloud and Barrett and Tiffa are responsible for like innocent deaths. For sure. Um, yeah, and so he's retelling his life story to Reeve and he talks about this sweet old lady that takes him in Ruby um, for a while, and I thought that was cute. And then he, yeah, then he gets all fucking Oliver Twist. Uh, <laughs> gets you know with a band of ruffian kids, and they're digging through trash and making their money, and you know whatever, because no one has any family left. Like the area is deserted because people are like, "I'm getting the fuck out of here," and fuck this. And uh, a lot of people are dying. Like Chris was saying, it's kind of like bubonic plague levels where people are dropping dead left and right, and ever at that point, everyone thought it was contagious they didn't understand that it was sad liquid born. depression yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's i mean who would guess that so and i guess it was kind of contagious in a way then right because it's like everyone's sad and feeling hopeless yeah, and pointless exactly, and yeah. then as people die they're feeling more hopeless and then they die and then it adds to the hopelessness so it was contagious. sephiroth's grand plan depression yeah yeah Just everyone be real sad about all the time fucking goth shithead jesus <laughs> 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 See, that's, I love that that's your reaction to this character. Because, I mean, you have a figure of him in front of you. Actually. Oh, yeah. So so Chris and Adam have actually set up a diorama for me because I don't know anything about this. Visuals are important. Actually, wait. Hand me, hand me the Sephiroth. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Let's look at this asshole. All right. He's got some ego problems because his sword is like twice his height. So he's making up for something. <laughs> a there. mass immune. It's like a fucking, it's like a fucking, you know, truck with huge tires. Like, get out of here. Uh... I don't know. He's got a lot of buck. Yeah, he's the goth ass. He's got so he's got more makeup than I do. <laughs> Very I mean, Bishonen. Why yeah. does he have one wing? What happened to the other one? Uh, um, metaphors. He didn't really even have a wing technically in the game. Oh, sort of, awkward. sort of, kind of. There, there's a thing at the end of the game. Doesn't not really that important. Yeah, he's a very slender man with some silver hair. He's got real dumb bangs. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean... This I, man yeah. is legendary in, oh, like, yeah. weeb circles. Yeah, he is, like, one of the most ultimate villains in Antagonist Kingdom ever. Why is he so cool? People like a really big sword and just his very gruff, yeah, do. stoic demeanor. Ugh. And he's pretty, too. I mean, I'm not gonna look at that action figure and tell you it's hot, because it's a fucking anime yeah, action yeah, figure that's weird. Sorry, everyone yeah, listening to this, you know, but it's weird. Sometimes we have to face the truth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Not everyone likes a Bishonen. Um, it's not for everyone. I don't know what that... What the fuck... Did, what are you even saying? Pretty anime boy. Oh. Yeah. Anytime you've seen a pretty boy with blonde hair in anime, Bishonen. Why blonde? They tend to be blonde. Well, he's got silver hair. He's they don't not have blonde. to be, but generally yeah, silvery blonde. They, 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 sometimes they have you know white hair because that's just you know it's it's a color to like uh, to, for them to stand out against other characters. Weeb facts with Chris and Adam. Yeah, I am very new. I don't understand anything. Also, right. I just want to note real quick that you know ne- I wouldn't wouldn't concern either. I wouldn't uh, say either of us are gigantic weebs or anything like that. Like it's, we're not. Uh, uh, enough. Adam, you, Adam, know, Adam, you and a- I watch. Super Sentai Power Rangers. That's not really that weeby, though. Don't. Uh, I don't think so. Listen, I know we're not. That's like, a different type of. Like, Embrace the That's weeb. a different thing. It's, it's just a slightly yeah, separate. Yeah, it may be. <laughs> I guess that's true because, yeah, Power Rangers, it's like its own thing. Yeah. I'm confronting some things right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's continue on with the story. Yeah. With um, the next chapter. All right. So, so the big reveal in the Denzel chapter is that Reeve was actually Ruby's son. Why didn't he visit her? What a I prick. know. What a prick. I know. And then and then there's like um there's these little one paragraph and like brief flashes at the end of every chapter and of course I like didn't know what was going on. So the first one that happened, I just wrote in all caps, "Why is someone inside the live stream?" I was <laughs> so confused because it was like Aerith or Aerith or It's Sephiroth at first. He's the one with malevolent intent. Aerith is the one that's like every other chapter where she has good intent. Oh, I thought she was the one that was first. No, no oh, that was oh, oh, whatever. Around. All right, then uh, this brings us to the Tifa or Tifa chapter. I, I was always heard. I always heard it pronounced Tifa whenever that's anyone. Usually, how I so did. It, but I thought maybe it might be Tiffany shortened. So yeah, maybe. Um, this is when I'm starting to work out what Mako is and Geostigma. That was the, that was my 
my journey in this part. <laughs> um, I said, wait, is Mako just fossil fuel? And then I was like, oh, no, actually, it's soul juice. Um, and then I was like, oh, OK, so geostigma is just oil that has become cancer because the Earth is tired of our shit. <laughs> kind of. Oh, my. Uh, so actually, oh, I. <laughs> Oh, you left an explanatory yes, note. the parentheticals are me explaining okay. to you in the notes about what's going on right here. I want to take this time to pipe up and say Tiffa's chapter is basically about her really wanting a family in the aftermath of all her adventures. And being and in love with Cloud, right? She's 100% I... in love with okay, Cloud. Okay, okay, I was right about that. It's all right, her childhood friend that she's kind of pined after for a long time. Okay, cool. During the course of the game, there was kind of a thing between Cloud and Aerith because he was kind of taking on her ex-boyfriend's well, personality. Well, and that's what I was, I was like, wait, so is she just trying to like like get in on this now that Aerith is dead like I don't a little bit after Aerith died it was devastating to the entire party they put her to rest in like a special place where she was actually killed like not far from where she was killed and they go to visit her sometimes yeah 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 the church over the course of the no not the church it's a oh. pool of water in an abandoned city where the oh. ancients I live I thought they said it was a church she had a church in Midgar but she was buried in a pool of water in an ancient abandoned city what do you mean she had a church she was the caretaker of a church Oh, oh, okay, sorry. I, all right, okay, sorry, oh, everyone. No. Oh, okay, oh, God, oh, God. We're Damn just, it, Barrett. <laughs> we're just going to leave them flat on their back yeah, now. Yeah. Their purpose has yeah. been so Oh, hard. no, no, I think, I think I might need... We'll, we'll, uh -oh. we'll pick them up and... Yeah, we can... Oh, the diorama has slay. fallen apart. <laughs> There's so many, so much media involved in this episode. Barrett got um, drunk off coffee. Yeah. <laughs> So this chapter is about Tifo really wanting to build a family. She's basically adopted uh, Denzel and also Barrett's adoptive daughter, Marlene, because Barrett just fucks off and he's like, here, take Marlene, Tifa, and take care of her. You were kind of doing that anyway. I got some shit to settle. Oh, I have some notes about Barrett in the Barrett yeah. chapter. But yeah, the Tifa chapter is just like her talking about, yeah, we got this diner and I really want Cloud to love me. I don't want a family. Uh, it's kind of it sad. It is implied in the course of the game that Cloud and Tifa may have hooked up shortly before the final battle. Cloud told everyone, go off and do what you need to do because this is basically a suicide mission. Wait, then, but didn't he like Aerith? Or he, Aerith? he did. He thought he did. He thought he did. Kind of, they never really but did. But they any... didn't bone? No. I got the strong sense that they were boning. No. <sighs> All right. So All right. Cloud and Aerith have this like pure love kind of thing that's oh, like never out of ended. here with it nah. no i'm not saying that's not my opinion that's like what is tried to be sold to you oh okay in, so, in the course of the game in the over here in the diorama that's not really a diorama anymore yes. this is tifa oh thank you okay i'm now holding tifa um she's wearing high tops okay that was yeah a, this is actually her advent children costume so just to specify but i uh, know she's going apron on like she's working in a diner okay yep. uh well, gloves all right she's a fist fighter her tits are pretty huge but that's the <laughs> thing and that's the thing with the series i've learned mm -hmm. uh yeah that's, that's a little it's a little scary and this yeah. is Aerith. is it okay so i once fucking dated a guy who named all his dogs after characters in final fantasy 7 <laughs> Was this a that dude for you, this? sucked i fucking hate that dude <laughs> He sucks shit. But did this influence you his, reading the story? No, one of his dogs was named Eris, and he always said Eris with an S. And then I was reading the book, and I was like, "Oh, is it a T A? What did I just mishear that?" But then Chris was explaining to me that it was like a mistranslation. Effectively, yes. Yeah, the game was heavily mistranslated at certain points. There the, was a line in the game that was, "This guy are sick." <laughs> <laughs> to the point also where the last boss is Sephiroth, but he's taken on an angel form. And he's supposed to be Savior Sephiroth, but they've translated it to Safer Sephiroth. As in, he's much more safer now. Yeah, he doesn't have a sword anymore. Yeah, he's <laughs> safe in the... So when you're fighting the last oh, boss, the, the this... name comes up as Safer That's Sephiroth. That's hilarious. <laughs> Not to be confused with Sephora Sephiroth, which goes to Sephora and yeah, just... Yeah. That's where his makeup comes yes. from. Oh, That's that, that actually makes sense. He's got a brand deal. Yeah, out. that makes... Oh, my God. Have they not made makeup based on Final Fantasy VII? Final Fantasy VII has had many, 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 many branding deals. There was a fucking yeah. cup noodle branding deal at one point. They, they had to have had a makeup set because they've made, make, they've made like, eyeshadow palettes and stuff for, like, a bunch of I'm pretty sure they sold shit. clothing at one point. With mm. Yeah, they've, they've sold clothing. And so, Square Enix, if you're listening, there's clearly a demand for Final Fantasy VII makeup. Yeah, please. Someone. So, and, Anyway, back to the story here. You're correct in assuming that there was some love triangleness between Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith. Cloud and Tifa, I mean, Cloud and Aerith had it kind of had this like pure thing that was never tainted by the sex, but they clearly had this thing going. Well, but but like Cloud only loved her because 
he wasn't really himself, right? Right. He was well, Zach. He, I mean, there's, there's, I think that's been one of the debates. That's like the implication. Right. Honestly. It's an implication, but it's never really clearly defined either way. After Aerith is killed, Tifa sort of like takes on this caretaker role with Cloud. He, Cloud actually falls into the life stream and is basically catatonic for a portion of the game. And Tifa Oops. stays with him, like, at his hospital bed until he recovers effectively. Mm. And she, the way they recover is that they both fall into the life stream again. Tifa is introduced to Cloud's fractured memories in, like, this psychedelic trance state. And they together untangle all of his person- personas. Is that like a mini game? Sort of, actually. Oh, yeah. all right. Cool. Uh, and then after, so after that chapter ends, there's like another one of those little piece, little ch- uh, paragraphs about the live stream. And I am at this point still confused. And I say, wait, why is Aerith still conscious inside the live stream? What the fuck is this shit? Her <laughs> essence is inside the live stream. The reason the live stream came to save everyone from the meteor is because Aerith was the possessor of the white materia. Yes. That cast the spell holy. And she was able to do that from within the life stream because her consciousness had not been fully subsumed yet. That was and one through of the... the power of friendship and contact with her friends in the real world. They were able to pray away the meteor. Sure. That was one of the final acts before she died. She's praying to the planet to try to get something to stop Sephiroth. And it becomes, you see in the cutscene the material falls out of her hair. So that's Yikes. where this all comes back. All right. So that's... The whole reason for that thing. Okay. Now one of my favorite chapters, oh. the Barrett chapter. Oh yeah, yeah. So, oh, so um. Barrett's a man with a gun on his arm because he yep. doesn't have a hand. Oh, oh I'm now being handed the Barrett figurine. He's very. Oh wow, upset. he's actually way heavier oh, than the yeah. other he's ones. He's a big dude. Which, he's a big dude. Which is, it's good that they kept that consistent. Um, Barrett had his hand shot shot off by Shinra soldiers. Um, he yeah, was part okay. of a coal mining town. He convinces coal mining town to go with Mako Energy, and then Shinra burned his whole fucking town down and shot Oops. his hand off, and now he has a hit of vengeance thing against Shinra, which is why he leaves the eco-terrorist group Avalanche. That's his backstory. Cool, yeah. Uh, he looks like he would co-star with, like, Dolph Lundgren and something. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely... Um, so, in the game, he was definitely heavily based on Mr. T. Not going yeah. to lie. Oh, 100% yes. not going to lie. I didn't yeah. know that. He is pretty close. Like, the way he speaks, even, is a little bit too on the line for... I think that it it wasn't terrible because a lot of people had, like, affected speech patterns in the text... And I didn't think it was too over the top. In the game, he straight up like, oh. "foo" like, yeah, all the yeah. time. Boy, you, you, okay. you really expect him to say, "I pity the fool." Like you're really um, expecting it. So yeah, at the beginning of the chapter, as Chris was explaining earlier, Barrett's like, "I know I have this adopted kid, but whatever, I'll just leave it with my friends. I gotta go do gun arm guy stuff." Yes, Barrett killed Marlene's father. Oh, because didn't he was know a that. psychopath that was trying to kill everyone. Meh. Uh, <laughs> and so. <laughs> He he was I don't know I have a note that says oh but what do I do with this gun arm he was like sad about it I don't yeah because he didn't have anyone to shoot with his gun arm because he's been shooting things for oh so right long. right he was he was at the diner or whatever that, or bar that they had come up restaurant whatever seventh heaven seventh heaven <laughs> much like the yes the CW show about a Christian thing seventh Isn't heaven. heaven. Blow up a reactor, <laughs> seventh heaven. We fund our terrorist activities with the bar tab. <laughs> I can't remember the lyrics. We we're going to have to pull the lyrics up to that at the end and improv a Final <laughs> Fantasy VII version of it. <laughs> um, so Barrett's upset. So, he has to leave because he has no one to shoot any longer. He has nothing to shoot with his gun arm. What is a gun arm man to do? So a gun arm man, he goes to his friend who makes a uh, arm attachments for him Uh, and this is what i dubbed him mr potato barrett because (laughs) (laughs) he was talking to this guy about getting a a different different hands and arms and stuff and i just they were just talking about him like uh putting them on and taking them out and i was like you're just mr potato head like get out of here this is stupid so in the game you can totally have like a pair of scissors instead of a gun or like a shovel at one point or just like a big fucking ball that you can beat people to death (laughs) Uh, i and then they're talking about He's going to this town, and they're getting there using a coal-powered vehicle. I was like, are there no pack animals? Like, fucking lasso up some chocobos, man. Yeah, like, chocobos why are, are you... explicitly the pack animal yeah, like, in Final Fantasy II. I was why mystified as to why they were okay, like, good. we can only use coal. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> what? 
chocobos are mentioned as travel things yeah. in like maybe, maybe a bunch of them just got sucked up by the live stream too maybe they, a bunch of them have geostigma we don't know no no no, 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 you, no, no, no they're fine yeah like they're they, fine chocobos are used remember yeah I mean but maybe they're rare you know maybe they become maybe they're all black they're still chocobos. chocobo racing at the gold saucer don't, don't yeah, worry yeah. about it I, so, th- so this okay. world has been thrust into depression and people need to lose their depression by still going out to gamble Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, but okay, I'm, I feel validated because I was also like, yes, why the fuck? Like, the Earth is already mad at you for taking energy from it. Why the fuck are you using coal? My God, you are. <laughs> That's adding... also like Barrett's solution to yeah! like no longer having Mako energy. Like... He's like, we'll just use fossil fuels. And again. I was like, that's not any worse. Like Barrett, that's still pretty bad. <laughs> like again, that's dinosaur souls. Like it's not it's any the same better. Thing, honestly, yeah. it's just Mr. Not P- Mr. T Rex is like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And then okay, so my favorite part of the Barrett chapter was every time he's mad, he just shoots his gun. So my note was, man, mad, man, shoot gun. Yeah, he yes. also happens in the game. Oh yeah, my he's, God. he's. I mean, he's. He's, he, need, he needs anger management, clearly. Also, it's probably a holdover from, like, you need to find a way to easily animate anger in, like, the weird character models that oh. were in the game. So, like, him shooting his gun by just vibrating the character model <laughs> a little bit is pretty easy to animate yeah. for anger. Um. Oh, and at this point in the book, this is where I was discovering that the life stream being, like, a river of souls and a Borg singularity was actually, like, a known fact. Yes. I thought it was, like, a secret thing that no one knew about. It's not necessarily, like common knowledge but people that have done research into mako energy pretty much know that especially since materia materia is basically the way they cast spells in this game it's crystallized life stream essentially and you place it into slots on your weapons and armor and that's how you're able to cast the spell by using the crystal essentially uh, okay. i mean you could if, if, think of it like if for people just who need a better explanation think of it kind of like thanos and the infinity gauntlet you know he has the stones in his glove like that's exactly what it is that's where he cast the magic from okay so they're like batteries so like people know about materia and that it's like crystallized knowledge of the ancients is what people call it, which is just the life stream Oh, okay. Um, I got pretty frustrated because Barrett just couldn't stop talking about how much he needed to repent. It was like he was just... He was like he was the exposition man, like he just wouldn't shut up about well, being very explicit. Of, and I was big just like... Wedge. Yeah, Jesse. We, we get it. Yes, you need to repent for being big crushy man. Oh, <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay, I'm, I get it. Like, every other page he was just like... Oh man, I really got I really got a tone. How do I atone? What do you know about atonement? Well, was, in, shut up. He, he doesn't though. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in Tifa's chapter, she also was trying to find purpose, and she she felt so bad about the lives that they yeah, they yeah. taken throughout the events of the game too. So this is a common theme between these characters. Oh yeah, yeah. How to find your sense of purpose in a world that is completely destroyed that you kind of helped destroy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 I get it, and I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with how aggressively in my fucking ass he was about it like just just like like tifa's chapter in that respect was better because she was actually she was having these like inter this, this like internal dialogue and it it wasn't just her being like how do i atone how i need do to I do atone? something i gotta atone what do i shoot now yeah, how do i shoot i need to atone for shooting by shooting i can become yeah. aggression man <laughs> yeah it just what do right. i need to shoot to save me from my sins. And then my final... Uh, yes. <laughs> what have I done? Uh, my final question was, wouldn't the life stream want more people to die to join the stream and add to its power? This is very dark. <laughs> <laughs> that is my question. I. It's this not... is a very dark world, it seems. I mean... Yeah. yeah. So you might have a point. Like, the life stream does have, like, sentient souls within right. it. I don't think it necessarily has an overarching purpose all the time aside from being the planet's juice right mm, okay. it, it doesn't like the, the only type of malevolent intent that you see comes from sephiroth mm. you know it doesn't the, necessarily have an intent it's right. just the concentrated soul mass it's, well i think it's i was nature working itself out i think i was confused because i thought eris and sephiroth were just kind of i thought it was like a like a singularity i thought they were just like it I didn't is? think I I didn't think either of them could direct it. I thought they were part of one. They are consciousness. Yes, I think. The re- um, get I, some, get some. Yes, some. No. Kinda. Okay. The reason that you're you're seeing uh, those chapters through their viewpoint and why it seems they're so prominent is because of the whole black material and white material. 
you know, those those are very powerful spells, and if somehow it's brought their consciousness to the forefront right. of okay. the live stream. I see. So right. now that was Barrett shoot man, madman. <laughs> yeah, must shoot. Make less sad chapter. Big crush man shoot. Man. I need to dig out these vegetables. I'm just gonna shoot them. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Potato Barrett. Uh, and then we move on to the Red Thirteen chapter. Nanaki, Nanaki. excuse yes, me. That, his real name is Nanaki. Red Thirteen is his experimentation slave name. Yeah, he did not. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, he was I experimented w- on by Professor Hodra, the same professor that experimented on Cloud and Sephiroth. Is that why he can talk? Yes, uh, uh, partly. I don't know. I think it is. So here's the thing, Paris. You might have noticed that Red uh, Nanaki talks about his family. Yeah. In this thing. He's a dog thing. He had a dad and okay, a mother. I thought he was a Pokemon. He's basically a Pokemon. He I wants mean, to be I'm the very present- best. I'm being presented with the Nanaki figurine, and he is definitely a Pokemon. He's got a flame tail. He's a dog with a mohawk. He's got, like, little feathers on his head. His weapon in the game jewelry. was his hairpins. His hair. He would like roll and attack people with his sharp hairpins. That's, that's very strange. He's a giant wolf. Why would he not use his claws and teeth? He does that sometimes with his special attacks, but for their basic attack, they're not, they're, they're not going to equip him with different types of teeth, you know? Yeah, like, you have to be able to buy things. For I, yeah, I guess. Oh, he's got some... How does he have a tattoo over his fur? Did they not think this through? It was through? branded onto him by Professor Hojo. Oh, okay. It's the number 13 in Roman numerals. Uh, yeah. Yes, Chris. I, can... <laughs> I need to explain to the people that can't see because we're in audio format. Oh, oh, okay. I so, thought you were telling me this. I was like, I'm going to fucking quick, kill quick you. Side note, quick side note. I think I actually learned Roman numerals because of Final Fantasy. Yes. Not yeah. even kidding. Yes. The, Thanks, we Final had to, Fantasy. We had to know what, which number it was. And we were like, Num- Final Fantasy V? What is this? <laughs> is his is this tail always on fire? Yes. Yes. That seems... Very All problematic. Right, so let's continue back into the thing How? about okay. Nanaki. Thank being, you for Nanaki. Yeah, he, his family is talked about. So he talks about his father, who was like this proud warrior who secretly, like, he's thought not to be a proud warrior. It's thought that he cowardly ran away, but turns out in the game, it's just a big emotional thing. Nanaki finds okay. out his father was like a proud warrior of his type, and his mom was the same thing. Right. They're both also dog things like that. There's no other mention of dog creatures like this in the game whatsoever. Huh. Now you might be asking yourself, me, Paris, wait, what about his grandpa? Bugenhagen that is mentioned. <laughs> oh, we're gonna oh we're gonna talk about that. Anyway, continue. What would you ass- you would assume Bugenhagen is also a dog of some kind? Uh, no, I made a note saying I cannot handle these name combinations because some <laughs> this is a thing about anime in particular that I just dislike. There's no coherence in the name array in a story. We've got Nanaki and Bugenhagen! <laughs> well, and Bugenhagen was also funnier to me because Hagen Haga is like a garden in in Germanic languages, and Bugen, depending on the Germanic language, it could mean uh, belly garden or bow garden, and I was like, either way you slice it, this is dumb. You know, oddly enough, knowing the way his character looks, might be onto something with the way his name was translated. But also, (laughs) Bugenhagen is a man. He's just a person. Okay. He oh. also has no feet and he floats around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he floats around. Nobody knows exactly there's how There's no it explanation works. <laughs> for any of this. He, uh, there's no, like, you, he, it's like did he adopt Nanaki? I was going to say, yeah, probably he, adopted, right? Th- you're led to assume this, okay. but in fact, there, no, no, there is no explanation for any of this. So, he, yeah, my... He's a floating old man with no feet that takes care of this dog. <laughs> some, okay. some people have drawn him like he's floating on a ball. Because, like, the character model shows, like, a rounded... Where his feet is supposed to be, it shows, like, this rounded thing. Oh. But... <laughs> um, yeah, so my immediate reaction to the Nanaki chapter was, uh, okay, why is this chapter point of view that of a Pokemon with Gilligan's Island inside of him? Because he calls the Geostigma that he gets infected with Gilligan... Yeah, he this gives is very it a stupid. name, and I was like, "This is so fucking dumb." I hate this chapter. I don't think it's actually Geostigma. I think no, he's just depressed. Yeah, it was his depression. He he's named not. Infe- but Geostigma is depression. No, he didn't catch the Geostigma. Oh he's just he's regularly he's depressed. A, he's a wolf no. animal, so they can't catch the Geostigma. Only the humans. No, it is. It is definitely Geostigma. There's no. They he, didn't he, mention he, him having any oily discharge, which is a side effect of Geostigma. Uh, if you have oily discharge, consult your doctor about trying not to fucking die and yeah, get, yes. get happy. <laughs> I don't know, man. Clap along if you... Anyway. Um, so anyway, Nanaki's chapter is about him going into the forest and like living as an animal for a period because he doesn't know whether he's human or animal because he can talk, but he's also a dog. Where do I belong? Uh, he encounters 
a small child about to be eaten by a bear, but it's some kind of monster bear. They call it a... a nibby bear. A nibby, nibby bear. bear, which sounds cute as hell. Yes, it nibby does. Nibby bear. Sounds like a mascot. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a bloodthirsty red-eyed monster, as is described, but apparently it is. It's about to kill this child, but Nanaki is torn because he doesn't want to... He doesn't want to get involved in the affairs of the forest, but he's also like, well, if I'm a good person, I can't stand here and let this child be murdered. So it says he grabs the child by the collar and saves him. And my note was, why does this child have a collar on? And that is never answered. Gear. Collared hunting gear. Never answered. I mean, Elmer um, Fudd had a jacket with a collar on it, right? You know, actually, yeah, totally reasonable. Precedent right there. Oh, Best like it. a shirt collar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I... Oh, you thought like he had like a choker on? Yes, oh, okay. what? No, better. <laughs> What are, you think about yiffing and like no. yiffing and calling, shit over yeah. here? No, Don't ruin I, my innocent I had, childhood. <laughs> no, but some of, I I misinterpreted some stuff in the text. So in the in the chapter where Cloud makes a brief appearance, um, I think in the uh, in the Tifa chapter, in probably. the Tifa chapter or whatever chapter it was. It actually it might have been in the Denzel. Cha- I don't know, but it's talking about uh, his his bike. And I thought he was riding a bicycle for like 15 pages. It, it took just has me pegs so and he does long. wheelies on it. Ding, ding. It yeah. took me so long to realize it was a motorcycle. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh that makes sense. No, this dude with a like, huge fucking sword is just pedaling around on it. Well, I, I, I mean, a bicycle. But like, if you're living in a world with like an energy crisis, to me, I don't know. My mind did not go to motorcycle yeah, that just requires bike fuel. lanes in this world too <laughs> yeah, I just, they managed to put those up still after the apocalypse i i thought cloud was riding a bicycle for like 15 <laughs> pages yeah <laughs> they've moved on to scooters now Cloud's not afraid of that stuff and he'll he'll do whatever he, he cross-dressed in the game so it's totally um and then <laughs> and then like so nanaki saves the little kid but then he discovers quickly that the kid is actually with an adult hunter and the adult hunter tries to shoot him and he and he leaves and he's like, he's like really indignant about it because the kid wanted to like capture him and keep him as a pet, but it's a fucking child that doesn't know any better. And he like puts the child and the guy who shot him on like the same footing. He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like f- those people are like, fuck those people. Like they're terrible. And I'm like, uh, I don't know, dude. Like the adult who shot at you and the little child who thought you were a cool pet, like, kind of not the same. <laughs> yeah, not totally. No. He's about to, like, let them both perish at the hands of the Nibby Bears because, like, the dad wanted to kill him. Yeah, and then so he ends up adopt. So the Nibby Bear that was murdered, turns out it was, like, a parent to two baby Nibby Bears that are, like, hiding in the brush. And he witnesses them, like, pawing at the corpse. And at first, you know, he has that same thought again. He's like, nope, this is the forest world. I shouldn't interfere. But then he's like, well, but there's these little babies. They need the love and they take care of them. <laughs> and so he adopts these little baby bears, which is really cute. Um, and... They just hang out in the forest doing forest shit for, yeah, like, two years. My only question for is... Two years. My only question is, like, the baby bears in this book are described as making a sound... That is written as Cree! And I was just like, okay, I'm assuming this is like a fantasy bear, so it makes a different sound, but it was just weird to imagine. So, they, they you know, the reason they're hunting the bears is because the bear tails. Uh, right, have we learn that later. Yeah, we learn that in a later chapter. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, 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 two years. Two years he spends, even though the whole time he's in the woods, he's actually supposed to be looking for a possible cure. For uh, geostigma, he's supposed to be looking for shit, but he's like, "No, nah, I'm just gonna go find myself yeah, instead." Yuffie and then asks him to like help her find like a cure for geostigma, and, like, and then like two years later, he's like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found oh, that about oh, that. I found that hilarious. <laughs> and when like, oh, she fuck, when she I asked I him forgot. about it, he's like, "Oh yeah, I was looking totally." <laughs> yeah, no, you, you weren't. You were hunting with two baby bears in the forest, dude. Stop lying. He had like a midlife dad crisis where he wanted to become a dad rather than not be a dad. Yep. It's like the op- the reverse midlife crisis. <laughs> someone Maybe actually these baby bears will lead me to the cure of geostigma. Yeah. Someone, someone, someone who desperately wants to be a dad instead of not a dad. Um, and so he, yeah, he's dad to these little bears, and they grow up, and then they get murdered. Yep, they're hunted, and that's sort of like what propels him out of the forest after that. And that's uh, like it, 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 the chapter is him like dealing with this like animal part of him and like whether he thinks that's 
his real self, but then at the end, after the two bears get killed, he's like, eh, I'm kind of both. I think. Yeah, yeah, he's like, eh, it was both all along. That was fun. I'm yeah. going back to this whole human so, thing. So, like, so yeah, so he sees that the bears have been killed and their tails have been cut off and they've been, like, hung up in the woods and he's really pissed about it and he, like, freaks out and goes after them. And all of a sudden, some dude rolls in with a cape and I was like, who brings a cape to the fucking forest? And it's this guy and he says some stuff and I really identified with how he's talked and I was like, oh, so I'm Vincent. Okay. And I don't know who Vincent is. Vincent is an optional character, much like Yuffie in the game. Mm. Yuffie and Vincent, you can totally skip by them. It has no effect on anything whatsoever. And Vincent is just ultra goth. He lives in a coffin. <laughs> he's been sleeping in the coffin for Not like even joking, 20 yes. years. <laughs> Because he's been made immortal by Professor Hojo. Um, his backstory is that he used to be a Turk for Shinra. Ah. And he was experimented on by Professor Hojo because Hojo didn't like him because he had a thing for Lucretia, Hojo's lab assistant. Okay. So Vincent had a thing for Lucretia. They kind of had a thing. Hojo was like, fuck that. You're going to get put into my experiment thing while I rape Lucretia oh, and experiment boy. on her fetus using Genova oh, cells. Oh, God. This fetus turned into Sephiroth. Oh, okay. Maybe we got to add a content warning at the beginning for that part. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry about that, but that's the backstory. Oh, oh, that's so unfortunate. Yeah. And Vincent Ho- Ho- is just Ho- super it- gothed out about all of this. Yeah. So I picked the most goth character to identify with. He that's is hilarious. turbo goth. Yeah. Like, that's really he funny. turns into monsters. He turns into like oh. Satan demons and shit like that. So remember when he says in the, in the book, like, I showed them my other form. Yeah, and I was like, what is he talking about? He turns into monster demons. Uh, so this is why cool. Red 13 probably identifies with him a little bit more in this chapter is because they Red 13 feels like, oh, I'm a dog thing N- that can Nanaki, t- actually talk yeah. to people. Yeah, I keep saying and Red 13. And also, but... he lives, his lifespan is like a thousand years. Yes. So he's dealing also, his existential crisis, like all of my friends that I just saved the fucking world with are going to die like way sooner than me. And Vincent and Nanaki agree to meet up once a year. Yes. And Vincent's like, that's all I can fucking take out of you, dude. Like, I'm not going to come out here more than that. I have literally forever to live. I have goth things to do. Yeah. I yes. have to sit in a fucking coffin. Hey, man. Just... You know, I got all these capes. I wear them all the time. It takes a lot of maintenance. Cape maintenance. <laughs> that's all Vincent's life is just cape maintenance. Yep. 24 <laughs> seconds. These... To look that turbo goth, you have to. Fucking... These Cure yeah. albums aren't going to listen to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all he's doing, sitting in coffins, listening to goth music. Uh, so that ends the Nanaki chapter. And then we end up with Yuffie, my fucking least favorite goddamn character. I hate this character. I hated this chapter. She <laughs> is the worst. Would. Yes. Oh, we really? You would. Really? Absolutely, okay. yes. Okay, good, good call. Yuffie in the game just basically tags along with the party just because she's like, let's do, uh, you guys seem interesting and you seem like you have a lot of powerful materia. At one point in the game, she does steal all your materia, and you have to, like, get it back, and you fucking have to, like, scold her and be like, her. Yuffie, what the fuck's wrong with you? Okay, come back with us now. Just don't do that shit again. No! <laughs> no, you don't welcome the thief into your fold. Get out of here. Yeah, and so she's explicitly just a materia thief slash hunter, and that's all she fucking cares about. But she's literally a child, right? She's 19. Oh, I... She's 19 and she talks like this? She's 19. Okay, the way that she was written, I thought she was like eight. Yeah, no, she's, it's she's, really she's, weird. She's supposed to be nineteen. That's what she looks like. Uh. Oh yeah, that's confusing. Oh, is she in here? <laughs> yeah, she's in the. Oh in the yeah. Block. No, I'm no. handing Paris a box. Are we getting another figure. getting another figurine? So just to give context All about right. what these characters look like. Okay. Yeah, no, I was picturing a small child with pigtails. I'm very confused. <laughs> nope. Okay. It's Yuffie long It's a teenager with a giant shuriken. That's very weird. The giant boomerang shuriken. Um, my first note in this chapter was, yo, little girl, fuck off with this hustling for materia at what is essentially your friend's wake, because that is how the chapter opens. Yeah. Yep. They're like all going to remember Eris, and she's like, yo, you got some stuff? You got my <laughs> yeah, she's stuff? Like, well, you're not going to need it anymore. So... And Cloud's like, I'll give you the healing materia, but I'm not going to give you the attack materia. She's like, but I want it. And she acts like a petulant little girl. I can't believe she's 19. That, she is a petulant little girl. Yeah, that's... Oh, I was also disturbed by Nanaki having a cell phone. That they was They all weird. have a cell phone. That's how you switch your party out in the game. Oh. 
call everyone up and be like, oh, can you switch out for my party? That's hilarious. <laughs> did, they, did they have like little sidekicks where that, the little no, keyboards No, you know, it's just out. a menu option. It's, you select it and it plays a ringtone and then you just switch out your party. Oh, that's funny. There. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a line where Nanaki says, are you serious? You are literally trying to rob me because she wants to take his cell phone. And I was like, yeah, why is anyone friends with this girl? She's annoying and all she does is take your shit. So she takes his fucking cell phone. Fuck off. He needs that. <laughs> yeah. He's a giant sentient wolf. He needs he, he a cell phone. He might to call someone sometime for yeah. food or something. Like, well, no, he can hunt, but like, you know. For help. Maybe he like, wants some kibble or something. <laughs> but yeah, she's literally just a petulant thief. That's- and then when somebody when somebody says something she doesn't like, she hits them. Yep. Why is anyone taking this? Why is anyone taking this abuse from this Silly child? Anime jokes. No, it's that, stupid. Yeah, she's kind of like the comic relief character a little bit. Her and Kate Sith are kind of. Yeah. By the way, Kate Sith is controlled by Reed. Yes, yes, that is explained in in the next chapter. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, but oh yeah, I had some notes here that I think I went over earlier. But this is the chapter where I, I. I didn't. I don't think I knew Sephiroth, and I don't think I figured out his name yet. So I said, "This goth dude who is causing the Geo Stigma really has a hard on for Cloud, and it's embarrassing. Like you have enough power to will life forms into existence, but you're hung up on some dude. Put your energy into your projects, not lusting after someone. Maybe you'd already conquered the fucking planet so, by now. <laughs> just, a, just in the game, actually, the final like time you meet Sephiroth after you beat the final boss." Cloud goes back into like his mind. It's like a mindscape type thing. Uh-huh. Sephiroth is shirtless. Oh, in front of Cloud. Oh, Jesus Christ! My so theory. there is like this like very so many fan fictions based yeah. off of like the sexual tension. But like, but like they must be right because I'm picking up on this while barely having anything to do with this. I mean, world. like the whole game is Sephiroth compelling Cloud to come to him, oh, join me George, in yeah. the live stream. We'll be together, Cloud. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the ultimate black magic so I can pound this planet's ass oh. <laughs> and take control from the inside. Pounded in the ass by my live stream. It's the next Chuck Tingle novel. Yeah. Oh. Yuffie's chapter really isn't that interesting. She bitches. No, I, I hated it. Yeah, I hated it. She like has a little bit of an empathy about people that are dying from geo stigma, and she tries to look for the cure. She asks Nanaki to find it, and he fucks off to the forest yeah, for two fucking... years. And then he comes back. He's like, "Oh uh, yeah, uh, uh, I definitely that. did that." I sort of think that the purpose of this specific chapter was just like, "Oh, we have this child, and she's trying to find her." Again, they're all trying to find their place, but like, she's like the super hopeful one, you know? Like, but it to an annoying degree. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, she sucks. She's the only one guaranteed to not get geostigma because she's just so fucking pepped up about, hey, I can find some more materia, maybe. Ugh, yeah, true. There's nothing much more to discuss about this chapter. It's just more effects of geostigma on, yeah, yeah. particularly her hometown of Wutai. Right. Um, so the final chapter is called Shinra. And my first note is actually about uh, Kate, Kat Sith or Kate Sith. Uh, is it Kate or Cat? Kate Sith is it's how Kate. we say okay. it, but okay. I think it's actually a mistranslation of the Irish Kushith, Ku C U S I T. Kush Kushalain. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yes, it's a mistranslation of that. Oh. But this is a mistranslation that has stuck. All right. Uh, my first note is: How exactly did a robot cat become accepted into a group of activists? Okay. Is it normal in this world <laughs> to befriend robots? Okay. The party is taking a break during the course of the game at the amusement park Gold Saucer, where there's all kinds of fun mini games you can play. Well, like the Rose. world is ending, but let's go fucking shoot some balloons. I this guess this is before the meteor comes down. Oh right. Um, and th- there's all kinds of roller coaster games, shooting galleries, sure. fun things you can play. Great. Anyway, in the course of this, Cloud and company run into this fortune teller, which is basically <gasps> a little cat thing on top of a giant. What you know what a moogle is? You know. What, yes, okay. I do. So it, Kate Sith the cat rides on top of a giant moogle. And um, he's a fortune teller at the Gold Saucer, and he, like, just kind of corners the party, and he's like, let me tell you guys fortune. And he, like, just pulls fortunes out of somewhere. I don't know where. Uh. And then he, like, gets a weird one. I forget what exactly what it is, but it's just, like, this really weird fortune that he's like, oh, that's never happened before. I'm going to follow you guys now to see what happens. And everyone's like, all right. Uh, <laughs> and he that's... turns out he's a Shinra spy. Yeah, that seems <laughs> Kind of weird. And then even after he betrays the party, he kidnaps Marlene and gives them gives her to the Turks. 
and also the Black Materia, I believe. Oh, yeah. We should so, probably yeah. specify that the Turks are like the mercenary force of the Shinra power electric. It's, they're not really Special mer- ops Shinra security is yeah, a better way to think yeah. about it. And so even after he does all this and like betrays them, they're like, yeah, you can, you can still come along. It's fine. Yeah, I don't understand that. That makes He's no like sense. He's like very repetitive about it, even though Reeve is literally the biggest piece of shit in the entire well, and game. They don't, do he they even... lets the plate drop, he spies on the part, and he kidnaps a child. Of course, he also helps like kind of get the black material out of the Temple of the Ancient because he sacrifices his robot body to get it out of the temple. There's a whole thing about that you don't have to know uh, about But that. he never visits his mom. He never visits his mom. Let's his mom die in the horrible accident. And he's technically like still part of Shinra after everything is over. Why does he suck so much? I don't know. And but wait, every- do they know who Reeve is or do they just think the cat is the cat? They find they out they eventually find out, that it's yeah. Reeve. Okay. But they just, they, he, Reeve is never at the final battle. Only his robot is ever at the final battle. Like, yeah, why would you have to, you know, be there in person when you can get your animatronic cat to go there for you? That's such a strange convention. JRPGs I- needed to have cute mascot characters in them and this was this game's. Wait, so what were what are some other examples? Um Choo Choo in Xenogears is what one. Is Choo-choo? He's a little fluffy thing that follows the party around and speaks in a cute choo voice. Oh. Um other RPGs have had just Wait, like... but the but Final Fantasy Seven has Chocobos. Those are cute. Yeah, but they're not sentient and they can't like seem oh, cute like that. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of a key part of the whole mascot thing is that they can speak to you and say cute shit. I see. Oh yeah. I guess that's Taco Bell Chihuahua in the 90s. <laughs> yes, yes. Essentially, yes. Yep. So that's the explanation for about Kate Sith. Continue okay. with the Shiver chapter. <laughs> uh, I still feel like the answer wasn't sufficient, but that's fine. Not, not, I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying you did a great job explaining, but that doesn't make sense. Yes. Um, <laughs> Correct. Um, oh, all right. So the Shiver chapter, I actually really liked this chapter because I got a lot of detail about the quote unquote bad guys, and it was, I, I thought they actually did a like in a short period of time did a pretty good job uh right, giving some one... some flesh like fleshing them out and giving them some humanity it stinks that this was the last chapter because yeah. I, especially for somebody just coming fresh into this i i thought that while i was reading it i was thought boy paris probably would want to read this chapter first considering yep. this has the most information yeah in it. i got so much detail i was like oh <laughs> but um i really enjoyed it um my first note about, so the the shinar chapter takes place Partially right as the uh, the meteor is okay. crashing. So, no, the no. laser that they tried to okay. break the meteor. Yeah, they're with. trying right. to like shoot. They're not trying to shoot the meteor. They're trying to shoot at Sephiroth, who is embedded in a crater in basically Antarctica. And if oh. they destroy the crater that Sephiroth is in, they think they can also get meteor at the same. time. they had some other things that they threw at meteor too. That was a whole side story thing. The important thing to note here in a little bit of world building that wasn't super fleshed out, um, it mentions that the Shinra building was destroyed and Rufus was assumed dead. Rufus is the president of Yes, Shinra. yes. Rufus is the president of Shinra after his father, just President Shinra. He's never given a name. <laughs> yeah. He's assumed dead. It mentions a weapon that attacks the Shinra building. Now, this is not like a mechanical weapon. This is a... Weapons are creatures that the yeah, planet spawns yeah. forth That's in what... response... Which is our immediate attacked. future, everyone yes, listening yes. to this. They're basically <laughs> giant kaiju that spawn when the planet is like, y'all fucked up enough, yeah. and they wreak havoc on everything in just, like, retaliation. They're really cool. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I, I, they explained that. They explained that weapons were monsters, but I was uh, like, it's weird that they call them weapons and yeah. also did monsters they, Did they capitalize it in the book? No. Yes, weapon is No, no, they, in the game, it, all the letters are capitalized. Oh. Which, I don't know what why that matters. It's not an acronym for anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so we're thrust into these two employees trying to see if the president is alive. It's see if Rufus is alive. And you spend some time with Rufus and he's in his office after everything's like falling to shit. And he's like fuck how do we fucking get out of here and he's hiding under his desk because you know some beams had fallen he was like well maybe the desk will offer me some protection and he gets under the desk he's like huh there's a button here well fuck it i got no other option so he presses the button and it says l on it and he's like ah and it opens up a panel and he just jumps in it and it's a big slide and i really like really liked the way that part was written where he was like huh well 
this is a weird way to die, I guess. Like, it was, it was just really, like, He's fatalist. He's like, very bemused the yes. whole way down. He's yeah. like, this is fucking stupid, yeah. but I guess. Yeah, I, I just liked it because I feel like that's how I would react to that situation. I identify with that. Um, And eventually, like, as he's going down the slide, he starts thinking back to his dad. The, this is the thing I didn't like, was that he realizes, oh, my dad put that button there for me, and L is for loser because it was, like, a stupid idea or something. And I was like, it would have been better just leaving it as, like, a, a mystery or, like, oh, somebody obviously put this in here as, like, a safeguard. Like, that whole backstory about the dad was just weird because, like, how would you forget that? Like, why would you ever forget that? It seemed like a pretty traumatic event when his father was like, oh, you want to escape? He, his dad's like, why would you ever want to escape a disaster? Yeah. What yeah. are you, a giant wimp? Yeah. What a loser. Ha, fine, I'll put an escape place in with loser all over everything. Yeah, and, and I And then was, he does. Yeah, <laughs> and I just, I just, like, I didn't, feel, I felt like that backstory was strange and it didn't need to be there. So anyway, the t- so my first question about this, this slide wouldn't his clothes catch on fire and his skin melt off because he's on a metal slide and it's going down 70 stories? Make a lube. <laughs> uh, like, I just feel like there would be some serious flesh-rending friction happening on that slide. Make a lube is what I'm going to call it. Sure. <laughs> um, but then he lands into a white room that has a big L on the ceiling. Like for his dad loser. went full out. Yeah, his dad... <laughs> But oh, then you the... made it this far. Well, now you're really going to see that you're a loser. Wait, but then how does the room get back up to the level of his office? Is it like in a, a sh- an elevator shaft? No, no. no, it doesn't. No, he's just down the, all those floors. I don't know why you think it rose back up to his office. Oh, because because when his uh, the like henchmen are looking for him, they're in his office when they find no, him. No, they're, the, they're on the lobby level. Oh, okay. I must have misread that. Sorry. My bad. So anyway, so he's trapped in this white room and he's like, well, I want to die, but I don't want to die in this room. And he's like desperately trying to figure out the passcode to get out because the room is locked from the inside. I guess. I mean, I guess that makes sense if it's like a panic room. And of course, it ends up being his birthday is the code. Like, duh. I just I don't know. I just thought like all that his was dad really he's a fucking loser. But also he cares a little bit. Yeah, I, guess. I just, just supposed I thought... supposed to be like the wink and nod there. Or yeah, something. I didn't like that. It's a little weak, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I felt like it was really just standard fare and i was like eh but um after that like he gets rescued by these henchmen or whatever uh but then quickly kidnapped again i forget the yeah he gets re-kidnapped essentially by like a doctor that is like doing geostigma experiments on people that have it he's actually like sort of benevolent at first but Mm. then turns to find out he's just trying to like None of the doctors in this world are any good. All scientists are mad in Final yeah, Fantasy VII. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot about this note. So when the henchmen are looking for Shin- uh, the President Shinra, uh, Rufus Shinra, they're fucking using elevators in a broken building yeah. in an emergency. This is how you die in an elevator. You yeah. never use elevators in an emergency. That's why they're henchmen. Oh. They're expendable. <laughs> You never use elevators in an emergency. I don't care what villain you are in what fantasy world. It's just common sense, people. Use the stairs. <laughs> Take the stairs. There's actually a lengthy stair climbing sequence that you can play in Final Fantasy VII to get to the top of the Shinra building. Are you fucking serious? Nope. Uh, yes, I am, actually. Oh, <laughs> the, I was like, uh. I thought you asked me if I was kidding at first, and no. I responded to that prompt in my head, but... There was an optional stair climbing sequence. Um, There's a note that when he's in, when Rufus is in the, like, the panic room or whatever he is doing like an exorcist style crawl along the floor and i was like why is this happening his like leg is broken or something but he he said he was like pushing himself with his legs backwards and i was like what you could probably roll over and just drag yourself with your arms yeah it was very it was (laughs) strange it's very strange um (laughs) he's he's re-kidnapped uh, he also has like he. he oh, wait, I have one last note about the henchmen. I'm okay, sorry. Please. So these two, we spend some time with these two henchmen, Rude and Reno. Reno. There's too many R's in this fucking <laughs> god book. Um. So Rude and Reno are this like henchmen team. I don't know. They seem like they work together a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're part of the Turks. Right, and there's one point where they're they're really sad because they can't find him. This is before they find him in the room. And they go and they each go into a bathroom stall next to each other, and they're talking to each other between the stalls. And they're like, one of them's like really dismayed, and the other one comes around and kicks open the other one's door, and it says, "Uh, 
I have one last present for my partner. And I was like, oh, these dudes are going to fuck in this bathroom. <laughs> Hell yeah. Like, I totally. Meteor's coming down. It's all over. Yeah, I totally. Here, baby. I was like, oh, damn, this is going to like fade to black. And they're going to have like some end of world sex in this bathroom. Like these two partners, they've had all the sexual frustration. But no, that's not what it was. I don't know if I'm disappointed or not, but it was it would have been hilarious. Nope, sadly, they're extremely oh, heterosexual. How many fan fictions have been written? Probably a lot of those, too. How many? Pretty much any character combination you can think of in this game, there's probably been a fan fiction written of it. Yeah. Oh, boy. Specific, like, this game probably has, like, the most fan fiction out of anything. Right? Oh, oh, yeah. <sighs> Absolutely. Well, you can continue with the story because I have my, my final set of notes about the last part. So Rufus is kind of, like, recaptured by this other doctor that used to work for Shinra, and he's basically trying to figure out what geostigma's cure and sources and everything. And he kind of goes a little bit like power mad. Uh, the doctor is Lemmy Kilmeister, first of all. Oh, really? Uh, because the, the doctor's name is Kill Kilmister. Yes. Which is one letter off from Lemmy Kilmeister, the, you know, the iconic man from Motorhead mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, well, uh, what's what's the band he was in before Motorhead? Um, I don't, I only know Motorhead. I don't oh, know Motorhead too, oh yeah. God damn it. Uh, why am I blanking you on this You can Google right this now? on your own. Listeners. Why am I blanking it's, on this? Anyway, so the whole time, this character was just Lemmy to me. That was who was playing evil this. Evil Dr. Lemmy. Yep, <laughs> evil Dr. Lemmy. And, like, he takes these geostigma patients to, like, these caves that have all the, like, are deep and set into, like, some mountains and everything. And he tries to help them out for a while. And, of course, he's kidnapped Rufus because that's how he can get access to, like, drugs and like Shinra. Shit. Yeah, like, he's getting access to, like, the leftover Shinra stuff by getting, like, notes handwritten from Rufus. Also, Reno and Rude just, like, take the, like, they look at the handwriting and like, that's, like, enough for them to, like, give this guy some materials. But they're also like, oh, wait, if we just give it to him and follow him back, he'll totally right, which is smart. meet us there. Yeah. But then they also don't even do that. Rufus, like, Rufus has to, like, float out of the cave when it starts flooding with water by, like, holding on to driftwood with all the other patients who, like, slowly drown around And this him. is for hours he does it. Like. Yeah. And by, by the way, Rufus was severely, was pretty injured. He, like, had se- many broken ribs. I think other stuff was wrong with him. Legs, maybe. I don't know. So he was the geo stigma. Yeah, so it wasn't like he could fight back very effectively, which is why it was so easy to kind of yeah. capture him. I mean, he tried. He fought a few yeah. times, but Lemmy got him in the end. Um and then like the ter- like he gets kidnapped again by the like there's this military officer that was like formerly a wing of Shinra. I this is where I stopped taking anything seriously. So this guy was like a lieutenant in the Shinra military structure sort of tries to take a leadership position amongst, like, the remnants of Shinra because Rufus is nowhere to be found. Right. And a lot of this chapter focuses around Rufus's ideas of, like, people need a leader. There's, everyone's going to be running around with no fucking goal unless someone yeah. takes the spear point. And the lieutenant here is sort of, like, the evil, I guess you could say, version, even though Rufus is also a little bit evil, too. Yeah. In a way. But this lieutenant's name is Kyle Gate. <laughs> and I lost it. I was like... <laughs> yeah, this is a very strange name. Too. I was reading it. I was like, what the hell is this name? name is Kyle Gate. So, uh, Kyle Gate, which is, to me, a worldwide network conspiring to juice up all Kyles with Monster until they're unstoppable wall-punching machines. <laughs> Kyle! <laughs> that's Kyle Gate. That's what it is. That's, that's his end game is to juice up all the Shinra soldiers with well, maximum monster, monster Mako. Until yeah. They... And until they can punch down the world. Yeah. Punch the walls down. Uh, so I couldn't take the book seriously after this, but luckily there was only like 20 pages left. Yeah. Like, I mean, honestly, yada, yada, yada. The Turks take out Kyle Gates operation and they save Rufus. I wonder if that was supposed to be like Killgate, but they just wanted to spell it differently or I something. Don't I don't know, but it's de- but, definitely yeah. Kyle Gate was the, the first. Well, again, the the inconsistency with naming in all these things like really takes me out of the element. Like I just I Japanese have... RPGs had a tendency to just oh, throw whatever it. name sounded cool at no, the moment. No, that's fantasy. Right. That's fantasy books too. Yeah. Like Richard Colin. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like we we've, we've talked about this before. I just it for some reason well, I think the reason is that, to me, if the names don't sound like they kind of belong in the same world, it makes it seem very rushed and thrown together to me, which is why I don't like that. But I get that for a lot of people that don't give a shit, but I don't know. For me, it's just one of those things that bothers me, I guess. You could argue that a lot of these characters from are from different parts of this world, so perhaps... Sure, but then you have things like Kyle Gate that just yeah. makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, like. It is. 
Totally dumb. Totally dumb. And the guy's first name, name was like Mutten. Like M U Umlaut T T E N. Mutten Kyle Gate. What, like, that's a fucking weird one. That, even for Final Fantasy. Uh, yeah, like that's like you just went to one of those like generator websites and were like, generate me an evil guy name. And <laughs> yes. it was like, oh, okay, I guess. Anyway, yada, 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 yada. The Turks get Rufus out of there. And then he basically, his mission from here on out is to find the remnants of Genova, which he thinks is a connection to the Geostigma. Right, right. He thinks that that's how it came about. Which is actually correct. Yes. Oh, okay. And so that's pretty much the end of the book, in a way. Yeah, and we didn't mention this, but all of these uh, point of view chapters, are they all have a very, very slight overlap with another point of view chapter in the book. So, for example, in like the Nanaki chapter, there's a point where he meets up with Yuffie, and then the Yuffie chapter, there's some uh, crossover with Nanaki and I think someone else. And like Sid. Sid. Yeah. The, the air captain guy. We didn't even talk about him. Um, yeah. So it, all, all of the individual point of view chapters kind of overlap a little bit with the other ones. They're all kind of connected in like a, you know. Steel Magnolia. Steel Magnolia. <laughs> so just a quick note. Sid is actually a party member of, you can, he's a playable character in the oh, game. Oh, okay. And he's an airship captain, like you said. Yeah. Um, but Sid is also a name that has been used in every Final Fantasy game. There's always a character named Sid. Weird. He's like this, recur- like Chocobos and Moogles. It's not a Final Fantasy game unless you have Chocobos, Moogles, and someone named Sid. Huh. Oh, yeah. So um, I said earlier that I was really impressed with the fact that this was edited, that, you know, everything was fine. Like, it wasn't not the best writing I've ever read, but, like, the dialogue made sense. People sounded like people. Um, the writing was okay. But I had a weird quibble about a single word right at the very end of the book. Mm-hmm. Why is vile spelled P-H-I-A-L? <laughs> I don't know. Vile? It's, it's a cooler way to spell. I don't know that that's an acceptable spelling of vile, is it? I, I don't think La- it is. Sorry, v- vile as in like a, a small glass jar, not like evil, but V-I-A-L. But in the book, it and it's spelled that way twice. File, P-H-I-A-L. And I'm wondering if it's one of those like P-H and V are very... Are P-H and V throughout uh, the... I don't know, throughout the history of language... Like those are sounds that are that change over time from one to the other. Could be something like that. Like a weird translation error. Could be I like don't a know. Japanese to English thing, much like R's and L's can kind of get confused sometimes. Right. Yeah, but it was just weird because the rest of the book was totally fine. There's nothing like that, and then all of a sudden, right at the end, file. I was like, <laughs> what? That's the one thing. Yeah. I mean, like, so overall, like, I was expecting this book to be way worse. To be yeah, honest me with you, too. Let me be honest with you. A lot of the other Final Fantasy VII expanded universe stuff is like cringe tastic. Oh, really? Do tell. There was a couple of spin off games. One was Dirge of Cerberus, which was a Vincent focused game. Oh, hey, I'm on board for that. It was garbage. Oh, it was work. like a third person shooter that was slow and sluggish oh. with an extremely anime plot that made oh. no sense and didn't have much connection with the Final Fantasy games. Never mind. It was like Vincent's personal, like. Re, he like went through all his traumatic events around Lucretia and Hojo and stuff like that. And mm. It was a bad time all around. There was okay. another game called Crisis Core, which focused on Zack, who was Cloud's former buddy that he took the memories of. And like, what was it? Was like a Zack focused game focusing on like what Zack was always up to all that time. Okay, and that was honestly it was kind of lame. It, oh. it wasn't as bad as their disturbers, but just kind of had lame anime cutscenes, a mm. lame anime plot that retconned a lot of shit and tried to like add more twists that were just dumb. Was it just like now we can finally see Zach and Tifa fucking or something? No, like, no Zach it... and Aerith. T- oh, Zach oh, and Tifa sorry. never knew each other. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Aerith, I'm I getting they met one, that one time confused. during that mission, but that's it. Aerith is very po- is very prominent in that game, actually, Crisis mm-hmm. Core. Um, but it, it, you know, it. It does so little to add to the to the universe. Yeah. It's a good game. Like I played it, I thought it was fine, but it doesn't. Yeah, it, it could have been more. And then finally, you have Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which we're going to watch. The CGI movie that was made as a sequel to Final Fantasy VII that everyone was mega hype about. Yep, we're gonna watch that maybe tonight. Yeah, for maybe the right now. <laughs> could, could happen. So if you're, uh, yeah, if you're a patron, that's gonna be up at some point on the Patreon. Um, but, uh, that's pretty much the end of this book here. Honestly, like, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna yeah, be. Yeah, same, it was fine. The only fine. major quibble I have 
Why is it called On the Way to a Smile? Oh, yeah, that title is real <laughs> so, bad. Yeah, the, oh. the, the naming conventions of the games and everything. And uh, I think the point of the title was to actually be, oh, you know, these people, again, we're, we're going back to the depression thing. Oh, right. you know, these people are hopeless. They don't have anything to look forward to. But each character finds something that they, you know, are hopeful in the future. And the about. book is pretty heavy handed about talking about smiles at yes. least once in each yes. point of view chapter. So I'm pretty sure that that's what why it's named. Yeah, that it way. is, but it's just a corny oh, fucking yeah. title. God, <laughs> yeah, but, I thought this was gonna be trash because the title, but high fructose content. Yeah. Of like <laughs> but all like honestly, it, all of these like anime type you know, programs or, or video games or whatever, they tend to have these like corny names a little bit. Like they yeah. just, that's just the way it is. And but that's one of the things that turns that's me just off. the way to... it is. <laughs> Ugh. But that's like one of the things that turns me off and why it's one of the things, one of the reasons I've never gotten into like anime shit. It's, and I, I will be upfront and I, I did not have good expectations going into the book. Mm. I had read some reviews about it that said, oh, it was, it was badly translated and it, it seemed like unnecessary. And a lot of, the, and some of the reviews said fan fiction-y and fan fiction itself isn't bad. Don't get me wrong. It's not. Um, but there's a clear, you know, there's, it's a clear cut case of usually when you describe something as fan fiction, it's a little bit lesser quality I guess because a fan is writing it well it usually just focuses around making characters fuck the that, person that wants too. to fuck yes. I mean that's that too I mean yeah, that's the truth that that's the truth about fan fiction so in that regard going into this book I thought oh my god are we gonna have just hookups galore or something yeah or yeah I was worried about that too but as a whole I think you know it's actually very clean it's yeah very, very clean. clean content and Going, you know, after reading it, I was surprised with how enjoyable I found it to be. I found it that it it explained a lot of the stuff that when I watched Advent Children, I was like, "How is this character in this position? In this, in you know, th oh, there was right. nothing to explain." And this book is meant to be the the bridge between the gap of the game and the movie. Good. So I'm like, I'm coming at this in the middle. I got a little bit of the beginning explained to me, and then I'm gonna watch this movie and probably laugh a lot at the bad CGI. It was pretty revolutionary for its time. Yeah, it's not... In 2005? Square yeah. Enix is well known for being, like, the one of the top-tier CG it, animators. Is it Enix? Square what? Enix, yeah. That's, they that's they, why... they push... Like, one of the things that attracts people to their games is, like, they push the graphical boundaries of right. their games. And th that was the case with this game, too, Final Fantasy VII at the time. Now you look at the character models and you're like, oh, my God, these... These people look like blocks stacked on top of each other with like weird <laughs> angles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, at the time, yeah. At the time, yeah. And the painted Wait, backgrounds are the best. What year did that come out? 97. So I was eight. Was that the same year as Super Mario 64? Or was that 96? I think 96 was Super Mario 64. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. So Because I remember a, when Super Mario 64 came out, it was like a big deal. Right. And it's yeah. kind of the similar graphical style, actually. If you look, Mar Mario has a lot of like angles in those. Oh, yeah. It, we're, we're in the cubism phase yes, of video yeah, games. Exactly. Cubists. Um, and then but, now the remake is coming out. Yes. Which. My, oh, can we talk about the boobs? Yeah. Briefly. This is just like a minor point here. So like, Adam and I are super pumped about the remake, even though apparently it's just the Midgar point of the game for now. Uh, They're just doing the Midgar thing first. Who knows if they get to the other stuff later. Yeah. Please, Square Enix, please, do it all. Please, 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 please. Okay, I, anyway. I think they know. So uh, there was uh, recently Tifa had not popped up in any of the promotional material until like a trailer was released very like a m couple months ago. And it was like a big, huge, oh my God, they've showed Tifa. She looks great. Except some people were so mad. That they reduced her bust size. They were going, censorship, how dare you, these SJWs. It's just like they brought it into a little bit more normal looking. Well, and also thing. when they were building that game in the mid to early 90s, because like if it came out in 97, they were developing it well before. Like, right, yeah. It's like, Tits were just giant blocks on body. <laughs> she like, literally had like spiky, like, kind yeah, of. Yeah, like yeah. it was very difficult to render detail in that kind of a system. I, I don't know. I don't know what environment the game was built in. I don't know enough about the game design of Final Fantasy VII, but at that time, like, you're not getting detail. I'm sorry. I realize that I'm talking to both of you. I'm holding my hands in front of my own <laughs> press and gesturing, and that is not a great Constantly. idea. Just, well, no, I'm trying to get the point that, like, it's... <laughs> In when you're working in very tiny scale, sometimes you have to make things bigger than they normally are. Yeah, so, exactly. and this also this goes for um, 
people on a stage so musicians um actors when you look at uh because when you're looking at something from far away you need to make sure things are prominent so makeup on actors and musicians and stuff is often really really heavy because it looks normal at a distance and that's kind of the same thing with video games right it's like you got to make things really exaggerated because they're going to be so tiny on these consoles and that's the same thing with the breasts on these characters like they were only giant because that's just what they could do with the software. I mean, like, Counterpoint, none, none Aerith, of it... and Yuffie, which are much less busty in that sense. But And, like, Tifa was played up as sort of, like, the sexy barkeep that's a member of your party a little bit. Oh, okay. But I don't think there's anything, like, censorship no, 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 about no. reducing a... Bu- like, because what it, are you because... really taking away? She still has tits. Well, like... yeah, and because it would be censorship if... There were like campaigns launched and the company crumbled to the will of the masses who were like, reduce her breasts or whatever because you're shaming women. Like, that would be different, but that's not what happened. They were just like, oh, we now have the ability to make breasts look normal. Right. So that's exactly. what we're going to do. And yep. it's like, that's not censorship. It's just people being, they, you know, yeah, they just want to complain about something, honestly. The whole, honestly, the whole like people sexual be- obsession with breasts in the, in much of the world is bizarre because. There are a ton of countries where breasts are just for feeding babies and they're not sexualized at all. Right. But there's just a a lot of countries where they're super sexual and like that's fine but like why do they have to be like size N all the time? I just you People know People got so mad. They were like <sighs> I'm not buying the remake anymore because if they're doing this then clearly they're going to get rid of other stuff. <gasps> See, the well, one thing, the thing that's definitely, well, that they amazing. said we're staying in, that, that I'm glad they're keeping in, there's a segment in the Midgar portion of the game where Cloud has to dress up as a lady. And it's not necessarily played super funnily. It's like, so, Tifa is, like, going to this mansion of this guy who's, like, kind of a whoremonger, let's say, just like he pays for sex all the time. Okay. And, like... Cloud and Aerith are trying to get into this place because they know Tifa's there. What she's doing there, they don't quite know yet. Um, and the bouncer at the front, like, when Cloud walks up, he's like, no dudes. Okay. So Aerith is like, what if we just dress you up like a lady? Yeah. And Cloud's like, all right. And yeah. they do it. And it's just like, Aerith is a little bit like, oh, you're so cute now, Miss Cloud. <laughs> but that's like about as like funny as it's played up for. Okay. And it's just like this part where it's like played as almost like they're, what's... What's the big deal? Yeah, this is the way I get in here. Yeah. It's And also like I look damn good as a woman. Yeah. Right? Like, he kinda, like, he kinda does appreciate right, it for right. a second. Well, as long as it's not So like if that was removed, I might be a little bit more upset because that's like cutting out this like whole sequence of the game that yeah. kinda has some plot relevance. But yeah, I mean, I get... Tifa's tits is not... Uh, no. No, yeah. I mean, it, again, it's not... Well, that's like the Lara Croft thing. There was also a tit uproar about that because they made... That, for the same reasons, her breasts were made smaller, I think. And people are mad about it. Yeah, it's... <sighs> people... Maybe these people haven't seen real breasts. You know, maybe that's I, what well, it is. Well, that's the problem. That's a lot of the issue is so too many people... Too much hentai. Pe- too much... Too people, much. People consume too much pornographic material where... Women, whether drawn or, you know, actual human women are like they tend to focus on people with kind of ridiculous proportions. And I don't know why but a lot of people are just like, yeah, that's just how that woman looks. And it's like, no, there are a lot of things that had to happen to make that woman look that way. Like, that's not how yeah. most humans look. And there's, there's nothing people that do look like that and like not to body shame. Sure. No. And I'm saying like there's nothing wrong if you do choose to augment your body. That's fine. But the unfortunate thing is that so many people like it's moved the the meter like it skewed the meter on what a woman is supposed to be because people are confronted with all these heavily augmented female forms and all this stuff so i i'm sure other people have talked about this in a much more nuanced and better way but it came up briefly when we were talking about this because i was like oh yeah i remember the boob uproar on the internet that's (laughs) what i remember yeah, that's how, I guess how we're going to wrap up a little oh, bit of the sh- section here is just boob rants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come to Terra Book Club for breast rants. All right. Um, all, all breasts are beautiful. We're not breast shaming. Enjoy your breasts. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Thanks uh, thanks for being here, Adam. Thanks for giving donating the book to the show and for being a guest. It was, it was fun. Setting up your diorama for visual aid here. <laughs> yeah, the diorama, actually, it, it was pretty helpful because... There were pictures at the beginning of the book, but I kind of, like, didn't associate... I was just like, yeah, the pictures, whatever. I, like, didn't really pay much attention to them, so the 3D figurines were helpful. 
<sighs> so at this point, we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters. Thank you, Dari, Greg, Will, Veronica, D, Jared, Lynn, Sina, Jakub, Torben, aka Duck King, Bobby Black Cat, Ayame, Jensina, and Mayo Cat, who recently confirmed that it is indeed a cat made of mayo. Gross. <laughs> no, amazing. Amazing. How does that work? If you too want to help support the show, you can do one of several things. You can head over to patreon.com slash join slash terrible book club to become a patron. At the $5 a month level or higher, you can enjoy special video segments and also download audio tracks where Chris and I watch movies or TV show companions to books we've read on the podcast. So we've done the Maradonia movie. Uh, we've watched all of the first season of The Legend of the Seeker. Um, and we are probably going to watch Final Fantasy Advent Children. So if you want to watch that with us, then you can head over to Patreon. Uh, if you don't want to or can't contribute financially to the show you can listen to the show on the radio public app and this actually helps generate passive income for the show so you can give us money that isn't yours which is amazing uh so each play on the radio public app gives us a couple of cents and then we get an extra dollar bonus if you listen to three episodes in a row so if you're using itunes or something like that just get the radio public app and said it's free you don't get any weird ads or anything i promise i use it myself i can i can attest to its uh decentness you can also share episodes of Terrible Book Club and links to the show on social media or simply tell a friend. Finally, you can always leave us a review on some kind of platform, usually iTunes, but anywhere is fine. Um, and remember that we enjoy interacting with you folks. So, you know, if you want to just send us a message or something, you can do that. Uh, you can hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Goodreads. You can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. We also have a YouTube channel. A lot of people love, oh, they love leaving messages on that. <laughs> That's definitely uh, the the dregs of our. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh we t we try to only respond to neutral or positive messages. Let's say we do not touch the the ranty people. Good, so, that's how it should um, be. But we also sometimes miss stuff. So sorry if if you did leave a neutral or positive comment, we haven't commented. Sorry, it's a lot a lot of social media stuff to worry yeah. about. I also handle me social media for my band, so eh. things get lost. Yeah. But uh, emailing us or, like, messaging us on Instagram or Facebook is, like, a way more direct way to get in touch with us. So, yeah, we like to hear from you. So, send, drop us a line. We would always love to hear from anyone that's bothered from us. Yeah. Um, do and, we want to announce the next book? Um, I'll let you do that. Oh. Um, I can't remember the full time of it. Me neither. It's one of those, like, long... Oh, actually, I think While you're doing, looking... Doing another, like, anime-ish book again. Really? God damn it. I think so. Let me check the schedule. Hang on. I got to I got to get some Excel. I got to pull up some Excel files. While you're doing that, I will thank uh, Adam, my brother, um, for joining us for this episode and for nerding out with me in front of Paris about a very beloved game in our uh, experience. Um, I can't wait for that rebake to just sit there, just waste a week playing that with you. Absolutely. I'm definitely <laughs> taking time off work. So, that's, yeah. That's <laughs> Um, I, Don't so, let your boss hear this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So our next book will be actually a patron's choice episode. Um, our next book is Jensina's pick. This is going to be uh, Contra Alliance Book One: Shadows of the Past. Uh, it kind of looks really anime. -y. I have it at home. I don't. I didn't look is anything it up about the it. Contra video. Game? That's what I was Maybe, thinking. Maybe because it kind of looks. I don't know. I guess we'll find out if we're doing another video game book. <laughs> yeah. So this was unintentional. Usually we try to space things out if they're kind of the same topic. But oh well, back to back video game shit. I guess maybe. Not actually sure what that book we'll is about. See. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. This is a so, complete surprise. So, Jensina, well, you'll see what you've done to us next <laughs> time around. Yeah. So, that'll be the next episode, uh, I think, I think in September, right? Yep. All right. All right. Well, we're uh, signing off into the sweaty August night. Goodbye, Paris. Goodbye, Adam. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.